Okay, so why don't we get started? We almost have 100 participants. I want to welcome everyone here today. Uh, thank you for joining us on this topic of career coaching. We have two career professional career coaches that I'm happy to bring to you and all the members here today. Uh, we have Mark Halpert and we have Mike Middleman. And Michael and Mark came to us through, really through, through Mike. And, and, and Mike is a member of the Columbia University Career Coaching Network. There's only uh, less than 30, I believe, career coaches that are vetted by Columbia. He's one of them and he came highly recommended. And he works very closely with Mark, and I thought it was a really good time for all of us to bring this topic to you. They have lots of wonderful career advice. We're gonna have a, lots of time for Q&A. Uh, so let's get started. I'm gonna hand it over to Mark and Mike. They're gonna take you through their presentation. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to post it on the Q&A, and I will interrupt on occasion to make sure that they're answered, and we'll give us ourselves plenty of time as we can at the end to get to all of your questions. So thank you very much for your patience and let's get started. I'm gonna go ahead and hand you over the reins, Mark. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, the title of tonight's presentation is what you absolutely positively have to be doing right now on your job search. Thanks to uh, the Columbia Alumni Association for having us tonight. Uh, I'm going to kick off with a new concept about call, uh, call tell your why. Um, if you're familiar with Simon Sinek, who's a pretty well-regarded uh, thought leader in um, many things, uh, especially marketing, uh, it absolutely um, transcends to your job search. Uh, your why is what propels you and makes you different than everybody else, makes you more relevant, and makes you more readable. Uh, really want you to think very carefully about what makes you tick and why you do what you do. Uh, shown another way, uh, the book has been diluted, uh, actually transformed into a one-page graphic by a woman in Australia named Lynn Kazali, who took this down to the golden circle you see in the, in the graphic. The what and the how are easy to hit if you're a dark player or if you're a, a, a bow and arrow enthusiast. But that why, that bullseye, is where few people, people or organizations really know how to express. So the book is named Start With Why. I believe it's essential reading. It's been transformative for my world. And um, there's an 18 minute TED Talk and I gave you the YouTube link right there. Do read, do watch the TED Talk, do read the book. The book is far more engaging uh, and, and a very good read. I want you to understand that it is a very great way for you to think about yourself and how you express yourself on your job search. And it refines itself down to this theme. You have to think and practice every answer to every question someone might ask you about how you demonstrate yourself in images, words, narrative. So everything you do that Mike and I are gonna talk about, this is a really good time to <laughs> sketch all the why out completely and understand what themes you want to hit so that when someone asks you the question, why do you do what you do, you have a ready answer for that. There's one concept I want you to take away from this and that is you are a brand. We're all consumers in everything we do. We all consume from other consumers. The biggest hurdle for anybody to believe in you, whether you're a job seeker or an entrepreneur, or whatever you do, is to make others aware of yourself, make them want to try you once, make them so happy in that one-time decision they made that they want to watch you, try you again and again, and that brand of you must stick out. You know, in a cereal aisle, on a grocery store, all the cereals sound, taste the same. At the end of the day, they all just look different. So craft your brand, craft the outside that makes people attracted to you, and invest in that throughout your career. I'm gonna hand it over to Mike. Okay, thanks, Mark. And uh, I should say that I'm a Columbia alum. I graduated the business school in 1993. And I probably network with probably at least 100 Columbia University alum on a weekly basis uh, as, part of my, uh, as part of my work. Um, so the Columbia network is an incredibly powerful uh, system and way to get in touch with people. And we'll talk, be talking a little bit more about that. So let's talk about what a WOW resume is. 
The resume has one purpose in my mind. It's to show what is special about you. I see so many clients showing up with bullet points saying, work cross-functionally with senior management to achieve the objectives of the organization. That all sounds nice, but it doesn't say anything. It doesn't say anything about your why, as Mark mentioned, and doesn't say what's special about you. So the whole purpose of a resume is what is special and different about you. Great, Mark, so we can the next page. So just in terms of an introduction, um, the resume, we talked about its purpose. One page is two pages at max. There's some reasons why you want it more. The resume is not supposed to go into the award you won in grammar school because you did something better than everybody else. People care about the last five years of your life. Um, I'm not saying don't have material from prior to the last five years, but people really focus on what you've done over the last five years, and that's what you actually have to, um, that's what you actually have to demonstrate. Um, I have a small technical problem because I'm losing my screen, but I just have to go back and forth. So there's also something called the applicant tracking system. So if you're applying online, you're going to be subject to uh, an HR system and you're going to be subject to uh, bots that are basically looking at your resume. And there are ways to figure out how the bots work. Um, and that's something that's important in, this, in that system. Um, Pre-resume preparation, Mark really talked about your why. If you can't explain to people who you are, it's going to come through on your resume, in the networking process, in the job search. And then we're going to talk quickly about what is the perfect resume. Great. Mark, next page, please. So what are recruiters looking for today? They want an immediate understanding of who you are. Recruiters will give you 12 to 15 seconds, and that's all they'll give you. If you don't create an impression, if you don't control that narrative, then you've lost them. They also want to see hard skills. That's obvious. Everybody puts hard skills in a resume. But what people generally don't do is put soft skills in a resume. The ability to work with colleagues, the ability to work with senior management, with vendors, or the ability to think outside the box. 95% of my clients do not put soft skills or enough soft skills on their resumes, and that is a major, major problem. As I mentioned, also the results. We need to see numbers, percentages, dollar signs. Even if you're not in a revenue producing opportunity or revenue producing role, there's still plenty of detail that you can manage uh, to put on a resume, even though you may not necessarily have hard numbers. Great, Mark, can we get the next page? So it's very hard to read and I don't expect you to actually read this resume, but this is a template resume that I think is very, very powerful. So we're just gonna look simply at what is highlighted in red. So at the very top where it says senior blank CTO, this is what I call a tagline. It's very conceptually similar to your tagline on LinkedIn, but it's short, it's three to seven words, which starts to control your narrative and who you are. Then below that, we have three bullet points from your past, which point towards the job that you want. Again, what you've done in the past is irrelevant. What you've done in the past that is relevant to your next job is important. So I collect job descriptions from clients we make sure that these three bullet points demonstrate the skills from the job descriptions. Well, guess what? In 12 to 15 seconds, someone can read the tagline and your three bullet points and know exactly who you are. And if you craft these bullet points correctly and you craft the tagline correctly, you have controlled the narrative. And that's what the most important thing at the top section is. Another idea that we'll show on this page is that there's a number of boxes that are in red uh, what I see the most clients do is they have a job, they maybe have for five years, they list, they list 10 bullet points in a row. Well, recruiters basically tell me that they don't read more than three bullet points in a row. The, the human eye just can't take it and the brain can't take it. So what you can do is split up your uh, responsibilities into different buckets or different themes. And that's what I'm showing in red. What I'm showing in red are different themes that we can rally bullet points and sub bullet points around. So it makes it a lot easier to read the resume and it makes it a lot easier to tell who you are. So again, content and style are just incredibly important when it comes to the, uh, the resume. Mark? Okay, I'm gonna pick up where Mike sort of left off. Um, you noticed on the resume before um, that he showed, it had a LinkedIn profile URL there. LinkedIn is the complement to your resume it is important for you to understand that whatever you put on your LinkedIn profile follows you wherever you go. 
So it becomes something that is the sum of the parts is greater. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The whole impression that someone gets from looking at your LinkedIn profile, if they are so inclined after looking at your resume. And each section, every recruiter, everybody has a preferred section they're looking for that's going to pull out and give somebody an idea of what they're looking for. They're going to look at that alone. So don't think that any one section is necessarily more important than the other. They all work together. They're all planned. They're all pre-fabricated for you. You have to be able to convince somebody that taken together, your entire value proposition sits on your LinkedIn profile, and it can also be read as fast as needed by a distracted person. We were all distracted. It's all a, be a bunch of different parts as you see in the picture. Um, I could lecture you on for hours on what LinkedIn is all about, how to make it great, but I decided what I would do tonight is talk to you about some of the newest developments on LinkedIn with uh, some, some highlights on things that you probably have seen on LinkedIn before but have become more important, especially in the pandemic age. First of all, your headline on your LinkedIn profile should not be VP Finance at XYZ Corporation or anything like that, not title at company. It, you get a, 220 characters now, up from 120. You have almost twice as much space to talk about the value you bring to the table. So get in there, rewrite your LinkedIn headline. That's the first place people look and start to think about you. Your about section is like your elevator pitch. It is now 2,600 characters, up from 2,000. Again, more space for you to talk about yourself. Use lots of white space between sentences and paragraphs so it's easy to read. Use complete sentences. This is a narrative. It is not a resume. So make the format in your LinkedIn profile as if you're speaking to the person who's reading. Your contact information. You've always been able to put your mobile number in there. I cannot tell you how many people do not. Your mobile number must be in your LinkedIn profile so people can text you. Recruiters love texting. It's fast, it's efficient, it's immediate. It's responded to immediately. You must be able to receive texts. If you don't, you will miss out on op opportunities. You don't wanna do that. So be sure to put your mobile number in there rather than your office number and certainly never your home number. Personalize your LinkedIn URL and use it. Make it so it ends with slash your name so that it's easy to place on places like your resume that we, we saw before, on your next set of printed business cards, in your email signature. Somebody receives an email from you, they wanna know more about you because you said something brilliant or something that they wanna get more background on you, then it makes it really easy for them to connect and link right to your LinkedIn profile. And on all marketing materials that you produce, all your slides, all your advertisement, all your marketing paraphernalia, you should have a really visually interested banner, never the turquoisey starry, starry night thing that LinkedIn gives you by default. Anything you leave on your LinkedIn profile by default shows you haven't taken the time to make it your own. So you want to make that banner your own. And there are many places to find banners that you can use. And then you should use graphics and multimedia throughout your LinkedIn profile as much as possible. Anytime you can use the thumbnail from a presentation, like I'll use the thumbnail from this presentation when I eventually post this recording to my LinkedIn profile, because it's something that shows that I'm involved with. Moving on, video is just absolutely huge in things that you want to be showing. It, you know, if a picture can uh, mean a thousand words, a video is worth a million words. You want to choose your skills very carefully. You want to be sure your skills are not something like marketing or finance. Those are subject areas. Refine them, define them. And then you want to go through the endorsers of all your skills and be sure that they actually know you for those skills. So they're never in a situation where they, they can't explain how they know you and in what circumstances. Groups are very effective on LinkedIn, especially for job referrals, because people of a similar interest are in a small area, like a silo in a group, and they're able to talk amongst themselves when they hear about jo jobs that are coming open. Hashtags and everything that you produce on posting, on sharing, add six hashtags. Up from three, now six, we're finding that the algorithm just perhaps is looking for more and richer hashtags. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then post and share. Post things you read that you want people to know that you're curating and share them and why you're sharing them. 
what in the article was interesting to you? Just don't like what other people put out there. Tell why you like what they put out there. Use the pronoun I and power verbs throughout your profile as if you're speaking to the board of directors and making a presentation. And then the more you tell the different themes of what you're trying to convey, the more it will resonate and be memorable to the reader. Again, the reader doesn't capture everything immediately when it's presented to him or her, and you wanna be sure you're saying the same thing in different places multiple times. LinkedIn is an active sport. It is not a, a spectator sport. You cannot sit and let it just go on by itself. It will fester. You must make it yours. You have the opportunity to make your LinkedIn profile say exactly what you want as you change, as you morph. There are four places to use search engine optimization keywords on LinkedIn. It would be your headline, your about section, your experience section, and your skills. And again, we'll talk about hashtags in just a moment. And then once you've used those search engine terms, other people can find you from your about, your headline, your about, and your experience. But there are other places to make yourself even more visible and active. Shared comments, again, with the URL and six hashtags. Quality connections who are willing to refer you. Groups where you can be active in asking questions and answering questions. And original material articles that you can write and post to everybody on LinkedIn. Whatever you do, however you want to express yourself, optimizing any, or let's hope mostly all of these, will show that you've really spent a lot of time on your brand to make your career and the efforts you are to brand yourself differently from everybody else that much more important and, and successful for you. Mike, you're up. <clears throat> sure. Can you just give me a second to switch over screens? So I just quickly took a look at the Q&A in there. There have been a number of questions about what can you do specifically in the COVID era. Um, so we'll talk maybe a little bit more about that in interviewing, but networking is actually perfect to do in the COVID era. Although there are statistics that show that people are working more because they're home, they have their children, the fact is, is that everybody's home, uh, or most people are home at this point. So networking, which I'll argue is the best way to get a job, is much, much more relevant in the COVID environment. Um, you don't have people in the office talking to other people. You have people home and they're standing or sitting in front of their computer. So in this COVID era where you may um, go through an entire interview process uh, over a Zoom or whatever the right technology is, um, the best practice in terms of networking, you can actually get a hold of people now. So I found that when I teach my clients how to reach out to Columbia University alumni, whether it be the business school or SHIP or whatever it happened to be, people are actually home. And if you reach out to them the best way possible, people are home, they actually will take your call. So I'm finding in the COVID environment that electronic networking is even more valuable because you can't do physical networking. So Mark, let's get to the next page and then let's, uh, let's dive in. Okay, I'll jump in um, here. You and, want to go? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll jump in and say that your, your application for any position that you find online is all important. Mike will tell you all the great ways of doing it, but I just want to interject that you, many people don't realize this, but LinkedIn has its own robust job board. The job board is on the top green line of your link, any LinkedIn page, and it's called jobs. You can refine the job search that you want to do by keyword, by location, by any of a m bunch of different multiple variables to find positions. Is this the only place I'm suggesting you go? By no means. But you might just find a position advertised on LinkedIn by a company that is refining it just to LinkedIn participants. And from there they can read your profile and from there they can decide the next step without having to go through all the extra work. So I'm just advising you don't shortchange the job board on LinkedIn. Go ahead, Michael, yours. Sure. So this is a bit of a point counterpoint. If anybody remembers the scene from Saturday Night Live where I forget whether it's Gilda Radner or somebody else says, Jane, you ignorant, I won't say the word. So Mark and I do have a, a slight disagreement here. I, I do think there's a, a spot for online applications if you're 25 or younger, but of my last 300 clients, 10 have gotten jobs and job boards and most of them were under 25. Um, so let's go to the very last bullet here on this page, which is gonna be controversial. Um, you wanna remove HR from the process as much as possible, and that's why networking is very important. I think that if it's HR people, you may be insulted. I think HR does a fantastic job when it comes to once you're on board, 
But I think that the more HR is, that is involved in the process, the more you're in a collective group of a thousand people trying to get the same job. So to me, networking is the way that people above the age of 25 um, can get the job. And the fact that we're all part of the Columbia Alumni Network is incredible. So the whole reason behind networking is that you can get behind the scenes of companies that you want to work for. Or if you're not sure whether you have the right skills for a job and you feel like you may need a certificate or may need to go back to school, you can tap the Columbia alumni or other networks that we'll talk about to really understand what's going on behind the scenes. Companies don't tell you what's going on behind the scenes. Company tells you what they want you to hear. When you get conversations with people behind the scenes, you get to find out so much, not just about the company, not just about the, the culture, but you can find out where the jobs are. Another reason why I'm a little negative on online applications is they show that for the 40 plus year old crowd, 75% of all jobs are never posted. And about half the jobs that are posted have already been filled internally or externally. Um, government regulations say you have to post them. So by the time you do the percentages and the percentages and the percentages, the number of jobs online that are real and that somebody over the age of 40, and of course there's plenty of people under the age of 40 on this call, but I think networking is really the most effective way to get a job. So Mark, can we go to the next page? So what does networking even mean? So networking, we break down, or at least I break it down personally into different buckets. There's number one, the people that will take your call. How you interact with the people that know you, love you, and trust you, and will take your call is incredibly important. I had a client call me up the other day, said, Mike, I've spoken to 500 of my contacts, not one of them can help me get a job. As we got into the conversation, we realized that my client was going for the throat, calling up people that he knew very well and said, I need a job in corporate finance. What can you do to help me? And that turned people off. My client was not respecting the relationship. The whole idea of networking is you must respect the relationship first, the job second. Yeah, we all know you want a job. We all know that times are tough. We all know that people are running out of money. You have to respect the relationship first or else you won't get to the job. So the people that will take your phone call are the most important people and how you communicate with them is just so incredibly important. Your existing first connections on LinkedIn. You know, like many of us, we may know some of our LinkedIn connections. We may not know them all. We may have just hit a button. I have 15,000 LinkedIn connections, um, as opposed to Mark, who has fewer number because he's more selective. I'm more of a, uh, a large networker. There's ways to use your first, your first connections on LinkedIn and there's ways, because you're connected on LinkedIn, that is a commonality and you can use that to your advantage. However, the biggest way or the biggest network that you can utilize is the one that you can create for yourself. So if we come over to this middle column, you can get referrals to other people. So if you know Bob and Bob knows Mary, Bob can make a referral for you to Mary. So that's powerful. And then what I think are the most powerful comment, the most powerful concepts are where you have commonalities. If you have commonalities with professionals in the workforce, that is dramatically increasing your probability that you will get a call with them and they will be able to tell you what's really going on behind the scenes. Again, how you conduct that call, how you get in touch with people on LinkedIn, what you say once they connect you with you. We don't have time to go through all that, but it's a whole chain reaction of doing everything appropriately. You have commonalities. The number one, Columbia. There are half a million plus Columbia people in the New York City area. Um, I'm constantly connecting, as I mentioned, with Columbia folks. When I want to link in with somebody, I'll say, Columbia 93 wants to connect. I won't tell them why necessarily, but I'll want to connect with them. I find that for every 100 invitations I send out to Columbia University, even though I went to the business school, who cares, we're all out of school, I send 100 invitations to Columbia University alumni graduated two years ago or 50, that's possible, <laughs> thank God, I guess it still is, of 100 invitations, at least 30 to 40 Columbia people will accept my invitation. When I go back and ask them, again, using certain words to say that, hey, a client of mine could really use your perspective or could use some job search advice or some career advice, I will get at least five to seven Columbia alumni is saying that they will have a conversation with my client. Again, it's all in the wording, but just think about that. It takes about five minutes to reach out to 100 Columbia alum 
and you'll get five phone calls out of that conversation. If you handle those conversations well, if you ask for a referral at the end of that conversation, you are creating a huge network yourself, uh, for yourself of people that you have a university connection with. Now, you also have a connection with former employers. I was lucky enough to be at Merrill Lynch. I was lucky enough to be at Credit Suisse. The number of Merrill Lynch, now Bank of America Merrill Lynch, to me it's all the same because it's larger. The number of Bank of America Merrill Lynch and Credit Suisse alumni that are not just in finance, but are people who have gone on to other things, like my self-career coaching, I was in all of business, is huge. So the fact that you share a common employer with somebody is very, very powerful. And again, you connect with 100 people, maybe only 25 to 30 will give you uh, accept your invitation. Maybe only three to five will actually have a phone call with you, but that's still pretty powerful. And then the idea of second connections. Again, I'm connected to Mark, Mark's connected to Jason, Jason and I are second connection. I cannot tell you how many times I've reached out to people that I'm second connected with, where I've said to them, I've asked them basically for a favor and I've asked them, will they speak to a client to give my clients some job clarity? And will 80% of the people ignore me? Yes, 20% of the people or 20 people will accept my invitation. And you know what? Two to three of those will give my client a conversation. So second connections are just so incredibly powerful. So I have 15,000 first connections. I have about 15 million second connections. So the more first connections you have, everything just goes up geometrically. If you connect with me, you will get my 15,000 first connections as your second connections. So if you're trying to penetrate a company of any kind of a decent size, there's probably gonna be a Columbia person there. There's probably gonna be somebody from your former employer. Even if there's not, if you can increase your first connections, you will get second connections in that company. I'll tell you the Trojan horse method that I don't tell very many people. I'm trying to penetrate a company of 20 people. There are no 10 people. There are no, sorry, I flipped. I went to Penn undergrad. I try, to, I try to penetrate a company of 15 people. There's no Penn people there. There are no Columbia people there. I don't share any former employers with them and I'm not even second connected with them. I will literally send out a first connection invitation and be respectful to literally every person in that company. When one person accepts my first invitation, I am now second connected to everybody we're first connected with. People are connected with first, people are first connected with people in their company. So if it's a 15 person company and I get one person to connect with me, I now get their second connections, which is probably most of the company. And then I send out a message to all these second connections. Hey, we have connections in common. I'd like to respectfully res uh, connect with you. After about five days, I have first connections with 90% of the companies. So there are incredible ways to penetrate these networks, not being, not lying, not being un unauthentic, whatever the right word is, but there are incredible ways to penetrate companies, even if you have weak connections with them. So this kind of network and hierarchy is what I probably spend 80% of my time talking to clients about. And clients are nervous about reaching out and there's fear. Yeah, nobody likes networking. My brother, who is the ultimate salesperson on earth, he's not on this line, he's not Columbia, he loves connecting. None of us like connecting with people. I'm an introvert, I don't like doing it. But there's ways you can do it because LinkedIn is so powerful and you can get conversations. And we're gonna talk on one page about what that conversation can look like. So again, why use a job board if you get behind the scenes and talk to people? Mark, next page. Now, when you go through the exercise of inviting them with certain words, and then when they connect with you and you want to use certain words to ask them for a conversation, and they agree to a conversation, and you make up a certain time for that meeting, all of these have to be carefully orchestrated. The question is, what do you do with these phone calls? So I'm going to assume you're trying to actually penetrate Goldman Sachs. So you've connected with Columbia people that are at Goldman Sachs. What is the anatomy of this conversation? I will call it an informational interview. It's not an actual interview. You don't know whether that Columbia alum actually has hiring power. Assume they don't. But it's an interview from the point of view that if you really hit it off with that person, they can refer your resume on to the right people. And it's also, it's, therefore, I call them informational interviews. You're getting information, but it could turn into a real interview. But 
how you handle this conversation is so important. And I go back to the same concept of respecting the relationship. You kick it on the phone with someone who you don't know, even though you share Columbia, and say, hey, do you have any jobs for me at Goldman Sachs? I really want to work there. That's not going to work. So use the inverted pyramid. I wish somebody could tell me what the name of an inverted pyramid is. If you know it, please type it in the chat box. So you want to thank the professional for their time. You want to let them know what your career goals are. You're not bullshitting. You're on the phone because you want to learn about where you potentially could fit in within Goldman Sachs. So you're being authentic and telling them that you have career goals and finding out whether there's a potential position for you. You exchange backgrounds with each other. And this starts to form the relationship. You talk about industry trends and what's going on with COVID and what's going on with Goldman if it's Marcus, their retail banking unit. The more you talk about the industry, and this is only a 15 or 20 minute call, the more you talk about big picture topics, the more that you develop a relationship with the, uh, the person you're talking with. And when you develop that relationship over that 15 or 20 minutes, well, then you can say, Hey, Bob, do you think there's anybody in Goldman that could possibly use my skill set? You're not asking for a job. You're saying, could somebody possibly use my skill set? And that's very, very powerful. You've disarmed Bob because if Bob doesn't like you, he can say no. Um, if Bob does like you, he'll go find the hiring manager for the, the area that you want to be involved in. So conducting these conversations from the general, slowly getting down to your ask, hey, can anybody use my skill set? It's a very powerful way to have a conversation. And the most important part is what we haven't even mentioned so far, follow up. The client of mine that told me that they had contacted 500 people and couldn't get anywhere, I asked him one simple question. How many people did you follow up with a month later? I'm not talking about the thank you note. Of course you have to send a thank you note, that's common sense. That's my client. 500 people you spoke with, how many people did you follow up a month later, give them something of value in that email so you don't just sound like you're sucking them for a job? How many did you actually uh, connect with a month later and try to give them some value? His answer was none. I said, well, that's why it's not working. Follow up is the most important thing in the world. If people will respect you if you follow up, give them value, you'll maybe create a little bit of guilt that they'll owe you some value back. Um, that's important. Someone just said, I caught it. What is value? Let's assume I'm trying to get in touch with somebody at IT and uh, Amazon just announced a brand new uh, Amazon Web Services feature. Um, if I know this person's interested in Amazon Web Services and they use Amazon for their business, I'll Google Amazon and see what's going on with Amazon Web Services. And if I find an article that I think this person might be interested in, I'll send that article. Hey, Bob, I thought you might be interested in this article. Bob, we spoke last month. Thank you so much for, uh, for helping me out. I thought this article might be really interesting for you. Just wanted to let you know that I'm still in the market looking for a position. Um, and uh, if you uh, think of anything, let me know. So you're keeping top of mind with them. If you don't keep top of mind, you fall out of place. There's a marketing expression that says, a consumer has to see something or have an impression seven times to remember something. So. A month later, you send them an email. A month later, you send them another email. You won't be a pain in the ass if you try to give value, an article, something you read, uh, something they're interested in personally. If you can find out they're interested in soccer on this phone call, uh, the soccer leagues around the world are starting to, uh, the, the, the soccer uh, uh, leagues are starting to go uh, in person these days. Mention the score of a soccer league. I'm not a big soccer guy, so I can't speak. That's why I'm struggling. But everybody loves soccer. So find out what this person likes. When you have that conversation with them, what we have on the screen, try to find out what the kids are interested in. Oh, I heard your kid's school is going both remote and uh, in person. How do you feel about that? There's a thousand concepts you can connect with somebody. So as long as you connect with them on a monthly basis, try to show them that you're trying to add value, they'll add value back and you won't be that pain in the ass guy who just sends them an email saying, hey, Bob, do you have you seen a job for me? That gets you nowhere. Mark, next. Okay. Um, so we'll have plenty of time for Q&A um, in, you know, probably five or ten minutes as we uh, start to wrap up the, uh, the formal part of this. But let's talk about some best-in-class um, interview techniques. 
Interviewing is probably the most artificial skill I've ever had to learn in my entire life. Nobody's good at interviews. It's completely artificial. What's your greatest weakness? Uh, well, I killed both of my ex-wives and put them into my um, freezer. Um, is that okay? You know, it's a foolish process. You have to give them a, a, weak, a, a weakness that's a strength. But let's talk a little bit about what really best-in-class interview techniques are. Mark, if we can get to the next page. Oh, by the way, my ex-wives are not in my refrigerator. It's actually too small. <laughs> if it was large enough, we don't have to get into that. So the whole idea about the interview is to connect with the person. Now, the first thing you have to understand is, are you interviewing with HR or are you interviewing with someone who you could be working with? HR, I have found 99% of the time has a checklist of questions. So therefore, you don't really want to create much of a relationship with the HR person. They have a list to get through. They want to hear your questions at the end. So the concepts on this page don't apply as much to HR. An HR interview, play the game, answer the questions, boom, boom, boom. And if you do well enough, you'll make it to the next round. But now you're starting to talk to the business people. So now let's say I'm in marketing and I'm trying to get into, uh, I'm trying to get into Google. Well, now I'm talking to a marketing person at Google. The whole idea is to try to connect with them on a personal and a professional level. That's the idea. So number one, understand who Google is. How is Google different than Facebook, than different than Amazon? When I was in investment banking at both Merrill Lynch and Credit Suisse, the very first question I would ask uh, somebody that was 28 or under, an associate or an analyst, how are we different to Goldman Sachs? 95% of the people had no idea what the difference was between Merrill, Credit Suisse, and Goldman Sachs. And believe me, there were huge differences. If you do not know the company inside and out that you are talking to, or at least how they differ than their main competitors, you're dead. Amazon has 14 to 15 very specific cultural values that you must demonstrate in an interview. They're not the same as the ones at Facebook. So you have to prepare. And you have to find out What's behind the scenes of the companies? There's so much public information out there. Don't just do a Google search of the first page and look up what's going on at Amazon. Go to the fourth and fifth page on Google. Do research. Show the person that you've done research because you, you want to be a Google. Now, the first question. So do you know how many of my clients, 20% roughly, walk into an interview, have the interview, and then three quarters of the way through the interview, they realize that they're not interviewing for the job that they saw the job description from. So in other words, the job description may have changed over time. The very first question to ask in an interview, obviously the other person generally starts the interview, the interviewer, but you have to get into the beginning of the conversation. Uh, Mary, I just wanna make sure that the uh, job responsibilities are the same ones that were enunciated in the job description. And if Mary says yes, great. If Mary says no, you gotta pause. You then have to get into a discussion of what is this job really about, and you have to pivot your style. So if you don't ask the first question, you could be marketing yourself to a job that doesn't exist. Okay. There's the common questions. Tell me about yourself. You know, the funny thing is the first time I, uh, I helped my son, uh, hopefully he's not on the cell phone call or this, 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 uh, this Zoom. I asked my son, tell me about yourself. He gave me a 10 minute answer. It was literally a recital of his entire resume. Well, you know what? If I'm interviewing my son, I have your resume. The tell me about yourself is a way to get into your personality and it's a way to sell the fact that you are appropriate for the job. So people answer the very common questions in very objective, flat ways. They don't interject their personality. They don't sell themselves. Every interview question or answer is a way to sell yourself. So you think common questions you know the answers to, you know the answers, but are you marketing those answers the best way? And then the difficult questions, strengths, weaknesses. Tell me about a time you had a conflict with your boss. Oh, well, he, he's in the refrigerator with my ex-wife also. No, you don't want to say that. So how you had a conflict with your boss is an incredibly important topic. And they don't care what the topic is that you had the conflict about. What they really care about is how did you handle the conflict? because how you handle conflict is so incredibly important in corporations because there are some corporations that are heavily hierarchical. There are some corporations like Amazon where one of their values is, we want you to argue. 
we want you to argue your position, not to the point where you're obnoxious, but Amazon want, doesn't want people to roll over. I would argue generally in investment banking there's a stronger hierarchy, so there's a little, little bit more of a respectful hierarchy going on. So you gotta practice those questions. Another person asked again, we talked about online interviewing. I've had three clients that have gotten jobs in the past two months, all online interviews. They literally never met anybody. So let's talk about what's important with an online interview. Number one, you wanna make sure that the background behind you is relatively neutral or has a simple picture. Don't make it complicated. I have nothing behind me because I just moved into a new office. If I were interviewing, I'd have a nice simple picture. You also wanna make sure that your lighting, you wanna make sure that the lamps, if you can get lamps that they're in front of you, you don't wanna have light coming from behind. What I've done here is not appropriate. If everyone can see my hand, that's my window. If everybody can see my hand here, that's the door. There's asymmetrical lighting going on. Don't do that because you can't see this part of my face. Again, I just moved into a new office, so I didn't have a chance to practice what I preach. You also want to be eye level with the person. A lot of times if people have laptops, they put them low and they sit up in a chair. Well, guess what you're doing now? You are talking down to the interviewer literally down to the interviewer. Metaphorically, you're looking down on them. You also don't want to do the opposite. You also don't want to look up to the interviewer because then you make it, sound, it makes it look like you're in a subsidiary, uh, a subordinate type position. You want to have equal eyes. So if everybody's looking at me right now, they should be looking directly at my eyes. Um, if not, shame on me. Again, I just, moved, I just moved to my new office. But the lighting is important. The background's important. Um, wear pants. Please wear pants. If I was an interviewer, the very first question I would ask somebody is, please stand up. Because you have to treat the electronic or online interview just as you would an in-person interview. The same level of preparation, the same level of getting your questions for them prepared. You have to wear pants. So I would actually wear do a Zoom call interview, the exact same thing I would in person. Because I know that there are recruiters who will say stand up. And if you're standing up in jeans and you're not in tech and you're trying to get a job in investment banking, you can sit back down and probably end the Zoom call right there. So it's about mutual respect. And again, you might be desperate for a job. You might be really nervous. But the point is, you have to come across as being, I'm interviewing you. You're interviewing me, and we are colleagues trying to figure out whether I'm a good search for, for uh, I'm a good match for your company. And again, you're nervous, you're scared, the bank account may be dropping. You gotta put that down, try some meditations, and really consider this to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone to really find out whether you are the right person for the job. And when you see things as equals talking to equals, it tends not to be as scary. So um, I meditate every time, but every time I go and to a situation where I might get nervous, you can look up online, there's many different meditation techniques. Mark? Okay, so there's too much information on this page, but just, you know, some things to keep in mind. Um, and I think I've talked about a lot of those. Um, once you get past the uh, interviewer and you're talking to a person who you could be working with, you wanna make it a Q&A. And one of the best ways to make it a Q&A is let's assume they say, uh, hey Mike, What's your knowledge of Python? Well, I took Python in school. I've been working with Python for the last 10 years, and I, I do have a certificate in Python. Don't end your answer there. Say, how frequently is Python used in this company? Or are there, are there certain departments that use Python more than others? It forces the interviewer to answer your question back. So when you ask a question at the end of an answer, you get into a rotation. You get into a dialogue. Now, one might wonder if I'm so good at dialogue, why do I have two ex-wives? But again, that's a conversation for another time. It's gotta be a meeting of equals. It's gotta be a dialogue. Nobody wants to sit there and ask you questions for 25 minutes, and then they sit back and you grill them for five minutes. That is the most boring interview possible. You have gotta show your personality because everybody's technically qualified for the job. It's the people who can show, again, I mentioned soft skills in the beginning, if you can show some of your personality, be careful of joking, but like I just, like I have here, many of you may get offended. 
okay? You don't necessarily have to joke in an interview situation, but if you can lighten it up a bit, if you can tell them what you're interested in when it comes to personal activities, I hike, I cook, or something else, everybody the interview is going to be qualified, or most people. The smartest person does not get the job. The person who gets the job is extremely smart, but knows how to connect with the interviewer, knows how to create a dialogue. And know your resume calls. When I was an interviewer on Wall Street, I was kind of obnoxious. I'd basically go to the very last activity of the person, uh, of the person's resume of their experience, and I'd say, tell me about that experience. Half the time, because the experience was so old, they forgot about it. If someone doesn't know their resume and it's in paper in front of me, I kick them out of my office. Know your resume. It is your marketing document. If you don't know something about your resume, the odds are somebody's going to figure it out. Um, so just trying to see if we haven't covered everything here. Um, a lot of this is common sense. You'll be able to read it. We send this around. We showed about clothing and don't, don't show up late, even for a Zoom call. Again, for the Zoom call, practice. Mark and I and Jason got on 10 minutes early. We practiced our camera angles. We made sure that we could share screens, although I had a technical problem trying to get back to my screen. Get on 10 minutes early. Check out how you look. Personally, I haven't had a haircut in four months, but I know that, at least going into it. So really try to get on that tech, on that call early to make sure that there's absolutely no surprises. Mark? So we're going to wrap up with right, well, some well, contact well, information for us if you'd like to get a hold of us. Here's Mike's page. And here's my page. Great. Well, I know we have plenty of time for... Uh, so Mark, would you like to talk about, yeah, let's talk about our, 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 let's do a little commercial, then we'll get to all the Q&As that everybody wants to hear. Mark, you want to take over? Sure. Mike and I have worked together for a number of years now, um, and we have brought together our capabilities to address a market that we think is sorely underserved right now, and that is college seniors, rising seniors, or college graduates who just graduated, to help them get that first all-important professional position. Unfortunately, many of them got cut short in the last semester of their senior year because of COVID. So they never got to the, uh, the career, career center. We have put, brought together in over four and a half hours of video, practical expertise, some of the tenets we talked about today, but really geared towards the, the younger, the college grad level to show how to use your resume, your cover letter, your LinkedIn, your networking, all these things and bring them together so you are stepping out you are best in class it's a program that we are putting our final touches on this week and next we are glad to uh take any emails or anybody who wants to know more about it if you have kids of this this age or you know somebody who does we'd be happy to introduce them to this it is uh it is designed to help them learn things they would not get in college because the career centers just are too ivory tower. They're not in the market like we are all the time. Mike, did I leave anything out? Uh, yeah, well, look, I, I think the idea is that parents are going crazy these days. The kids are home. Uh, they're playing video games. Um, if they're still in college and they're not going remotely, or if they are going remotely, they're stuck at home. Nobody wants beer spilled on your carpet because your kid had a party on Saturday night. Uh, we're, we're finding parents who are just so freaked out because their kids are home. They're bashing heads with each other. So one of the reasons why we put this video series together or video program together is to help the parents. Get the kid out of the house, get them paying taxes, get them independent. So it's really for the parents at the end of the day, but it really does teach college students um, how to get a job. The other issue, Mark, I don't think, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, it's shown that half of all college students don't even go to career services. So when I was working with my son who graduated Dartmouth, I said, oh son, I assume you've been to the career service offices um, because I'm looking at your resume now. He looks at me and says, no, I didn't go. At which point I said, why did I just spend, sorry, why did I spend $35,000? Why did, did your mother, my ex-wife, spend $35,000 if you're not taking advantage of school's uh, facilities? He said, I know more than they do. This is the same kid who is brilliant, who answered, uh, tell me about yourself in 10 minutes. He didn't know everything. Matter of fact, he knew nothing. I love my son dearly. He's incredibly bright. He did not know about the interview process. Half the kids don't even go. It's, it's crazy. 
And, and I but, would add to that, Mike, if I could ju jump in. Um, these are skills that, these are life skills that everybody needs to carry along with them no matter where they are in their career search. Uh, in this type of uh, economic time, there are people being laid off all the time. That's the most difficult affront you can possibly have because of no fault of your own, there's a reduction in force. So then you're suddenly out on your, uh, looking for a job. These things happen. They happened to me very early in my career, and actually I learned a tremendous amount of it about it and how never to let that happen to myself again. So if these are skills that we're happy to teach people of all ages, but primarily start with them at a very young age so they can build on them as they build their career mentality and their career successes. Yeah. The only thing I'll add, and let's get to Q&A, which is really what the people mostly focused on. I work with a woman who was two years uh, actually worked at Merrill Lynch. She was two years uh, out of school, did not like her job. I helped her basically transition to another position. She just got laid off two months ago, but she was able to find another position within two months because of everything that we had taught, or everything, everything that we had discussed and I had taught her basically two years ago. So the skills that I taught her, she remembered, and she was able to pivot to a job that much quicker. So as Mark mentioned, these are life skills. The way you find a job, let's be realistic. My personal point of view, the way you find a job is networking. Has that changed from the 1950s to the 1920s? No, it really hasn't. It's all about the network. It's all about everything we've talked about. There's no radically new ideas about there, out there. There's best in class ways to go about it. Once you learn it, you learn it forever. And with all the online tools, there's so many new capabilities that we have without even realizing they're available to us. It's all a matter of knowing how to master those power tools. Uh, a power tool is very dangerous if you don't know how to use it properly, but once you know how, you can make amazing things happen. That includes your resume, your cover letter, your LinkedIn, your interviewing, all these, and then especially the networking. Great. So we'll go on to the next. Do we want to take questions? Well, we wanted to uh, wanted to jump back in here and announce some winners. We wanted to do a giveaway. First of all, I want to thank both you Mark and Michael, a uh, round of applause. Thank you so much for that great talk. Uh, lots of useful information. I know lots of people were taking notes. We have about a dozen questions that I wanna get to, but before that, I wanna ask everyone who's on this call, we have a full participation today over, you know, we have 100 participants, uh, over 200 registered. So um, thank you for everyone for sticking with us. We're gonna get to all your questions in a minute, but we do wanna give away uh, Mark and Michael were so generous to offer up a video session program uh, for free, which has a $500 value, as well as a one hour uh, or, or intro session with one of them for uh, it's worth about $500 just to get started uh, for anyone who really needs even more in-depth career coaching. Uh, keep in mind the work that Mark and, and, and Michael do, uh, you know, they charge thousands of dollars uh, for their services. They work with people, you know, they rarely work with people, uh, never on a one-off basis where it's just one consultation because it does take time. Uh, but uh, definitely recommend taking advantage uh, of this opportunity. So uh, let's first start off with anyone who is either uh, a college senior, uh, a parent of a college senior, knows a college senior, or someone who just graduated who would love to have a free session uh, with the program that is just offered up. Uh, so I ask anyone who would like to offer that up, just type in your, your name into the chat, and we're going to go ahead and pick a random name, and you're going to be our lucky winner. So I'll give everyone 30 seconds to go ahead and type in a name into the chat. I apologize for any of those who are calling in and don't have a chat available to you. We have lots of names coming in. I'll give it a few more moments. Being chosen by an impartial, impartial marketing expert right now. Yeah, I am going to select a random person, <laughs> but I first have to have you guys stop putting your names in. <laughs> wow, lots of interest here. All right, ten more seconds, and we'll close this off. All right, we have a winner, Nicole Kaiser. Nicole Kaiser, please contact us after this and we'll make sure you get your certificate for your panel, excuse me, for your video program. So thank you very much for joining us and congratulations to you. 
Um, and I'm sorry for all those who were interested who didn't win. We're going to have lots of information to follow up. A lot of things that Mark and Michael said, links, ideas, suggestions that are in the deck, you're going to be able to get and take advantage of right away. Next up, for those of you who just want to spend some time, introductory session with either Mark or Michael to really get into some of your career coaching challenges, please go ahead and type in your name into the chat. We'll select one of those people in the next 15 seconds or so. Go ahead and type in your name. As I mentioned before, Michael and Mark work with folks for weeks to get things in order. There's a lot to delve into, as you can see. Uh, this is a wonderful intro session to what they do to get you started. Um, value is $500, so we just wanted to offer this up to you as a, as a thank you and an introduction to their team and their, their skills to help you. Okay, we'll wait 10 more seconds. Anyone else, please type in your name and we'll go ahead and get this started. Okay. Last, okay, so the person who has won this is, the name is, drum roll please, Barry Abelman. Barry N. Abelman, Abelman, Abelman. Sorry about that, Abel. Uh, Barry Abelman, Abelman, please contact us and we will get you that certificate. Thank you so much for joining us and congratulations. So with that, let's get to some Q&A. We have some great questions, about a dozen or so. If anyone here has additional questions, please feel free. We have a, a solid half hour left. We're going to give a few minutes to each question and see what we can do to get through them. So I'll start with a few things that I thought were interesting. Um, this one would be for you, Michael. What are your thoughts on sending a note within LinkedIn? When you link in with someone, how critical is it to, to write a note? And what should be in that note? Okay. So if you do have a commonality with them, which I talked enough about, uh, I, I would add a note. First of all, I'd always add a note. It increases the chances that somebody will connect with you. Well, not everybody reads their note. But if I were to uh, uh, connect with somebody who is Col uh, Columbia, I would uh, put in my note, again, this is when you invite somebody, just to take a step back, I think the question is, when you invite somebody to connect on LinkedIn, you have the option to use a note. Correct. Um, I would use a note saying, uh, Columbia 93 wishes to connect. Right. 1088 wishes to connect. Uh, Merrill Lynch uh, 93 to 2000 wishes to connect. That's it. Or hi. Okay. I never tell them why I'm <laughs> connecting. I never tell them why I'm connecting because number one, I'm honestly connecting because I want to build my network. But let's be realistic. I want a job. Right. If you say to them you want a job, they're not going to connect with you. So the next great question is what happens afterwards, which we can talk about if someone wants to. But the most important thing when you send a note is remind them of the connection. You, if you are part of the club, right. university, employer, if you're part of the club, remind them you're part of the club. Sure. Does it sound... And so does it sound fancy? Does it sound, you know, a little snobby? Yes, but it works. Got I'll it. jump in here because this is an area of my expertise and that is, um, and this is where Mike and I have a bit of a dis difference in opinion. I never ask somebody to connect blindly by connecting, by asking them on, on a connection request. I try to find somebody who knows somebody in between the two of us and ask them to grease up the skids for me. Ask them to say, I've worked with Mark, or I know Mark from wherever we were. Maybe it's not a university connection. There's so many other ways to connect through something similar. And I always send a warm, personalized note. And if any of you are going to try to connect with me tonight and send me the boilerplate note on LinkedIn, I have to tell you, I'm not going to connect with you. I want to see people who have the power, the interest, the fire in their belly to tell me why there's that why again, why they should connect with me. What's in it that I can help them with? And then it's at my discretion to look at their LinkedIn profile, decide if it's somebody that I can help. And if I can give them 51% and they give me 49%, then I will call them on the phone. Just like Jason, you and I did not connect until this afternoon when we first spoke on the phone. I do not connect with anybody I have not spoken to and gotten to know and vetted. That's a difference that Mike and I have. Our purposes are different. 
but as a LinkedIn coach, I know too many horror stories about people connected to strangers and live to regret it. It's not a good idea. Always find the common ground. Always talk about how that you can help somebody else. What's in it for them? Sounds great, Mark. Back to you, Mike. Thank you for that. Um, what do you say to someone when you're sitting in front of them and a hiring manager says, you're just simply too overqualified for this position? What's the best way to respond to something like that? If somebody says that, well, if somebody says that, what I would probably pivot to is talking about how you've kept your skills current or if you haven't kept your skills current. So I would try to prove that you really do have the skills for the job. So I sorry, you said overqualified, not underqualified. If someone's over, really overqualified, yeah. over, sorry. Overqualified means you're too old. The person can't say that, it's illegal. The number of people that I know that get hired who are too old for a job are extremely low. I would probably refute it by mentioning the fact that you can teach other people, refute by mentioning the fact that you can get up to speed that much quicker. But you could also just say, you know what, that may be the case. Are there other positions that you think I might be able to be appropriate for? Because there's an argument to, there's an argument to always fight back, and there's an argument to give in and say, fine, is there another position for me? If it's a big company and there could be another position, I'd pivot immediately. If it's a small company, there's only one job, fight for your life, tell them how you can mentor people, how you can get up to speed quicker, and tell them how um, you spent, you know, especially if you spend a lot of time at a prior job, you can say, I'm not a job hopper, but that's what they're concerned about. Right. You're overqualified, you're gonna hop. But it's a tough one. Yep. Mark, this next question is, I'd love for you to answer. What do you do when you have this gap in your career where you had to take care of childhood, uh, child care, uh, you have an issue with someone in your family. There's all kinds of reasons why people take gaps and then you have to explain it and you have to uh, address it in an interview. What's the best way to approach something like that? Yeah, I get this question a lot and it's a really good one. It's, it's very common. Um, explain what you did, what you learned from that gap, how you, hone some of your existing skills from being in the corporate world or the office world into what you did in your home life. If it's taking care of somebody who's been sick, if it's a, a child or if it's an elder parent or somebody like that, or you were sick, talk about what you learned and what you gained from that experience. That is, you know, like Mike was saying earlier, that makes you real. That makes you interesting. That makes you stand out from the rest of the crowd and that makes you a better candidate because you've taken in this experience and you've digested it. You've learned how to do it. I don't know who asked that question. If you email me, there's a link on LinkedIn that they show what you might wanna say about bridging these gap years. Look, let's face it. No two careers are always linear. They, there are lots of stops and starts. There's a lots of changes in and out of industries. Any of these things, whether they're dramatic, like someone taking care of a sick child, or they're just in and out of a different industry, talk about how your skills develop, no matter what industry you're in, because these are the soft skills that employers are looking for. Thank you, Mark. Back to you, Mike. Um, you talked about ways of getting into different companies through LinkedIn, but let's say that's off the table. What other things can you do? What advice would you give people who are targeting very specific companies and they want to get their attention, but obviously they don't want to go overboard? Uh, is there a line that you can cross? What are ways that are creative that you think are within the appropriateness realm uh, for a business professional to get someone's attention in a world where we get a thousand emails a day and a thousand texts and we're so inundated and everyone's worried? How do we break through creatively? This was a question that was asked. Okay, so assuming LinkedIn is not on the table. Um, in addition to I LinkedIn, let's say, in addition to, uh, as complementary to LinkedIn, um, what other creative ideas would you recommend? Yeah. So, I could, if you know the hiring manager, you could consider, consider sending a handwritten note to the hiring manager. Um, if there's other people in the company that you would want to work with, you could send them a handwritten note. Let's be realistic, who writes handwritten notes? I can barely sign my name anymore because I, <laughs> I don't use penmanship. So I think that's one way. Number two, when the world gets more normal and you can go to sessions, if you know this company is presenting, if you know this company may be at a physical presentation, 
if you know the uh, online, if you know the company is going to be presenting online, that's another way. Um, God, that's a hard one because I teach LinkedIn ways to network so often. I would say handwritten notes. I can't think of anything else, Mark. Um, I've heard of people who've sent really large envelopes or tubes <laughs> to FedEx to get right. attention. I mean, that, that that's a little overboard in my, in my opinion. Um, LinkedIn is, you just don't have to send messages through LinkedIn. You could do your research and find an email address for somebody in the same company, which gives you the email address of that CEO or CXO. There's lots of ways to play that game. There are lots of ways to find people who know other people and you can use LinkedIn as the lever to right. get you closer to those people. So don't think that it's all just one off type of me to you. There's all sorts of people in between who can help make that happen. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for both of you. What are the best two or three pieces of career advice you've ever received or that you've recommended to help people who are a little bit stuck in trying to find that next path for them? Well, I'll start with one. Stop being stuck. Come on. <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> and we were all taught not to talk about ourselves. Clergy, parents, teachers, don't be the kid in the front who's always talking about spouting off. Well, you know what? They're the leaders in the shaker. So let's stop stymieing human ambition and let's start talking about ourselves. And let's talk about ourselves in a way that people are interested in what you have to say. Not me, 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 but how I can help you, help you, help you. And get out of your rut. And I, I, I work so hard with some of my clients to get them to talk on LinkedIn about where they came from and what they learned. And I say to them, why do you do what you do? First question. And they fun for it and they screw up and they have no idea. Sit down, figure out why you do what you do, why you did what you did that makes you who you are today, and then where you want to go with all that great knowledge and great experience and go for it. Stop holding yourself back. Anything you want to add, Mike? So, uh, yeah, I think it makes, I'll make a distinction between you sort of have a feel for what you want to do versus you have no idea what you want to do. If you sort of have a feel of what you want to do, guess what? A Columbia person is probably doing that. So use some of the networking tech week techniques that we talked about, not to get an informational interview, but to have a strategic call. So you email, sorry, you email or you link or you connect through LinkedIn to a Columbia alum and you say, hey, I'm honestly learning, I'm confused about what I want to do with my life. I really just want some advice about what the job's like. Right. There's no better validation than the marketplace. Sure. Now, if the person says they have no idea what they want to do, I generally don't take those kind of clients. I think that the uh, the book that Mark, and Matt, Mark mentioned in the TED Talk, I think there are some coaches out there that will help you um, how far back in your history you want to go in terms of finding out your personality. There are some career coaches that can help you start from, I have no idea what I want to do. So sometimes I think you may want to hire a professional it really gets into career direction. It's just not my specialty. Understood. I'll, I'll add another one, and that is that a lot of the career coaches and a lot of the uh, recruiters that I speak to tell me that younger candidates cannot write. It's really sad. They cannot convey a complex thought in a simple way. Even Columbia undergrads? I'm sorry. I'm I beg not to talking differ. necessarily uh. to this audience, but... <laughs> But nonetheless, it may, not be, it may be your kids, but nonetheless, <laughs> for younger, uh, younger um, candidates, I always say to them, show a writing sample. Let's just yeah. get that out in the open and let's just make it all clear. You can write and it's not your writing samples, not your resume. It's sure. something you pre presented or something that you did and show your skills in the Microsoft suite of services, show your skills to m generate a concept. That's so important. Another question that we get a lot of uh, in the Q&A area is about second careers, changing fields, changing um, entirely what you do. What, what advice would you give? It's probably one of the roughest spots when you realize that, you know, you want to be a chef, but yet you, you've never done that before. Um, even if you have the licenses to be a chef, you still have to figure out, you know, how am I going to get hired and do all this? Um, in a way that is a transition, right, uh, for my life. So what advice would you give towards people who are fed up with what they do? A lot of people, I think, are questioning these things now um, with the pandemic. Maybe they're looking to change careers now that 
things are, are, are much different in our world. What's the best way to go about that? Go ahead, Mike. You want to take that one? So that's a tough one because when you change careers, it most likely will take more time. Now, you made the assumption the person's qualified. If for some reason they want to become a chef, but they don't have the certifications, then they have to go through the education. So one issue is do you have a knowledge gap that you have to get over? Um, but I think you have to think about what are the most transferable skills that you have for the new position. Read 50 job descriptions for what a chef does on a day-in, day-out basis. It's about business management. It's about time management. It's about human resource management. And then I'm going to sound like a broken record, but find a Columbia alumni that is a chef. Talk to that right. person and find out what it is. Because I guarantee you it's that. not about... Yeah. It has to be. It's not just about making food that people enjoy. Uh, no. I'm not a chef, but I can only imagine it's a massive business at end of that job. Sure. And I would jump in and say that, you know, it's okay to change your career. Embrace it. Don't feel like you failed. They can never take away the experience from you. Whatever you have, whatever experience, skills that you have that you can show, whether you show it on LinkedIn or your resume or your website or whatever you're going to create, talk about where you came from and how the wealth and the richness of what you did in the trenches provides you who you are today. Talk about who you are today and where you want to go in your future. When you can re respond to past, present, future and orientation and what your life is all about, people buy in. They're fascinated. They want to bring you along the journey. Uh, my journey, I was a banker and then I was a corporate finance guy for way too long. I was happy to leave both. I went out on my own and I haven't looked back and it's now been 19 years. So everything that I do today, doing this talk right now, are things that I learned as a banker and things I learned as a corporate finance guy. Those skills are mine forever and I just keep making them better and making them attuned to today's world. Thank you for that. Another question that has come up has to do with relocating. People who are relocating, let's say from New Jersey to Florida, what mm -hmm. advice would you give them as they relocate as an individual considering another state and the job markets there? Well, I have an, a client that exactly did that, and my advice to her was the following. A, figure out who your alums are down in that area. Anything you have in common with other people. Join a political party. This is the time to do it. Get involved. You'll meet socially. They're business people. Get involved in, if there are chambers of commerce left anymore, get involved in any sort of smaller group of people where you can infiltrate and find out who the movers and shakers are in your area. What she did was she went through all of her first level connections and looked for people within a 50 mile radius of where she was moving. And then she went to all of their connections on, who were in the same area and asked the first level person to introduce them to the second level person. And all of a sudden she found her entourage and it was great for her, it was successful for her and she loves where she's living and she's thriving. So I'm thrilled with that. It takes a lot of gumption and a lot of self-confidence to go thrust out your hand, if we can do that anymore, or pick up the phone and say, hi, you don't know me. I'm a Columbia alum or whatever. We met through so-and-so, and this is what I'm trying to do. Do you know anybody I could speak to? It's all the networking stuff that Mike talked about. Yep. <clears throat> and actually, if I can add from a resume point of view, and this is something that actually never came up. I'm glad this question came up. There are very few, as we talked about, there are no rules in this game. Some people like an aggressive resume. Some people like a less aggressive resume. If a client likes an aggressive resume, I'd say, if you're moving to Key West, Florida, use a Key West, Florida address on your resume. Use a cousin, use an uncle, use a friend. Nobody, it's very difficult to get hired when you have a New York address in Key West. You want to have a local address to show people that don't have to pay for your moving, show people that you're local. Again, it's an aggressive move. I'm not advocating it, not, not advocating it. But if you're aggressive, put down an address of the local area that you want to move to. Thank you for that. We have a few people who wanted to understand your position on how to utilize their age. You know, any advice for the people who are over the age of 50? Uh, we had one person say that they are a little bit fearful of saying the year they graduated because it, it ages them. It, it, it says their age immediately. 
what's the best way to use, I'm not gonna say age, I'm gonna say what it is, it's your experience. Maturity. Uh, maturity. maturity. Yeah. To your advantage where it's not a disadvantage because as much as you guys just mentioned that there are laws, people don't care about the laws, they see someone who's older and they might discriminate against them. Uh, they, they might not do it outland, you know, right in front of everyone, so that it's obvious, but there is going to be some of that. I go to so many companies where everyone there is under the age of 30, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, it's, it, I'm next. <laughs> you know, uh, there's not even one person over the age of 40 in this, in this office. Okay. Um, so this is something that has come up a lot, and I just would love to see any, any thoughts for those who are a little bit older and, and really want to be able to utilize it for a positive as best they can. Mike, do you mind if I jump in? Um, I have a particular expertise in baby boomers, people born between 1946 and 1964. I'm one of them. And I wrote an entire online course for baby boomers and how to find a new job, how to embrace your age, embrace the experience that you have, learn from what you're going to say, speak to people of other generations. They're going to know approximately how old you are by the way you express yourself. They're going to know how old, approximately how old you are by where you started working, when you started working, and even if those companies even exist anymore. There are telltale signs that people can figure out within the decade of how old you are. You know what? Like I said before, get away, get out from under yourself, express your age, express the richness of your experience. If it's a company that is going to practice ageism on you, you don't want to work there. It's not right for you. So don't try to make it work for you. I taught at, uh, at a, a social services agency for eight and a half years of people who were baby boomers who were in deer in the headlights mode. They had no idea what to do with themselves. They couldn't embrace, embrace technology. They couldn't figure out how to talk about themselves. You have to be as good as the younger people in your technical expertise in your understanding of using the Microsoft suite because that's not expected, that's assumed. So everything you produce is going to be telltale about how old you are, don't worry about it. I was lucky enough a couple summers ago to go to LinkedIn's headquarters in New York. I was the only person there with gray hair. The only other person, people there with gray hair were younger people who dyed their hair gray. <laughs> On purpose. I didn't matter, it didn't bother me because I can't be somebody I'm not. I'm not gonna be a 40 year old, that's decades ago. So folks, if you're of the similar age or you're in your 50s and you're worried about how you're gonna come across, get past it. You can't lie about your age. Thank you for sharing that, that's great, sure. thank you. Yeah, you I guess the only thing I'll throw in is, is pick the industries and the companies that are most amenable to hiring folks that are 50 and older. Consulting, um, other types of butcher. There's not that many, but if you, if you find out the company culture and if you pick the right industry and they're more amenable to people who are older, that's helpful. Um, I think we're also gonna see, because of COVID, there's a lot of companies that were very young. They were started by 25 year olds. As these companies mature and wanna go public, they need the gray hair Number one, they need the gray hair. And number two, they need the gray hair for purposes of the uh, public disclosure documents. So I think some of these companies that are growing very quickly are gonna look for the adults in the room, either to have an adult in the room or to give the appearance they have an adult in the room for going public. So but it's hard, it's very, very hard. There was also a trend of companies hiring older people who were leaving one industry and coming into another industry. There are some companies that embrace that diversity uh, there's a lot of diversity in companies, a lot of push for diversity in companies. And so you can market yourself into the, diverse, the diversity department of the HR department to try to find what the opportunities are. If you meet a stone wall, move on, like I said before. Thank you. We have uh, less than 10 minutes left. Thank you to the 75 of you who still stick with us through this uh, great talk. Um, Mark, Mike, it's, it's been a wonderful to have you with all this wonderful advice. Um, gets you thinking about all the types of things that anyone who's looking for a new career can start doing immediately uh, to help themselves. Um, we have one last question I just wanted you guys to get into, or maybe two more. If you're in the same company 
for like 15 or 20 years. How do you brand yourself? How do you mm. have something interesting to say about yourself? Um, even if you had different positions, you know, what, what, that, that's another way of being stuck for some people. And this is a, a direct question that came in. I want to see if you could answer how to best brand yourself within a company you've been to a long time. Go ahead, Mike, take it from the resume point of view. Sure. So the, the question is, is in a bit of a vacuum because if a, client, if a client wants me to work on a resume for them, I say, well, where am I going? And I have three job descriptions. So if you've been at a company and had many different positions, where do you want to go? Because where you want to go influences what should be on paper, influences your interview style, interviews, networking. So number one, where are you going? So that's an important question. Um, People will generally care about what you've done. Again, I mentioned over the past five or 10 years. So don't mention 15 years ago, no one cares. Have it on the resume. Always have your titles in the resume in years you worked there to show promotion. Um, but I would focus on the most recent five to 10 years. Um, I would admit the fact that you have no idea how to interview, even if you've interviewed <laughs> internally. You have no idea how to interview externally. Um, you probably don't know how to network. So you should probably hire somebody to help you do that. So I think a lot of the issue is admit what you don't know and, uh, and get help. Sure. Um, but again, the last five to 10 years are really what you should stress because nobody cares what you did as a junior person. Now, if you went from department to department to department and they were all different jobs and they all lead up to the job that you want, there's an argument to give more resume geography to the older jobs. But as a general rule, if you're in that boat, get help because yeah. you need help. Sure. One thing that LinkedIn allows you to do is if you've been in the same company to ladder your experience within the same company through these many jobs. So you can show one job led to another, led to another, led to another. Please be sure not to just lay out facts about I worked here, I did this, I did this, I did this. Talk about how I worked on a project as a junior member of the marketing department, which led me to interface with the sales department and they brought me on as a sales contact with a marketing background. And I learned sales from a marketing position and then moved on to, and show the, the story, the narrative, talk to the audience because you have lots of room on LinkedIn where you don't have room on the resume and it gives you more flexibility to straddle why you took on the next position. I was asked to join this department. A new department opened and I was a charter member of that department. All these things, they're in the back of your head. You just haven't said them. Say them and tell the reader why you made those moves and why thus you stayed with that company 15, 20 years, like we said. That's really important because if you don't tell us, I say this all the time, we don't know. And if you leave it out, we make assumptions and those assumptions are going to be wrong 90% of the time. You're a lifer, you're stuck, you're in the rat race. What's wrong with you? That's not what you want people to understand. You want to tell them the story about how you rose through the ranks, how you started as the mail clerk, and now you're the VP of finance. Whatever that story is, tell your story. It's so important. And that's how you get more notification, more people appreciating and honoring you for that work. Great advice, Mark. Thank you. Last question, and then we'll wrap things up. In the age of COVID, with everything that's going on, a lot of folks are asking the question of, what does the job, job market really look like this year? Um, are top companies really hiring? What does the outlook for 2021 look like? Uh, another question along the same lines, will remote be the new normal? And if so, should I start networking with Columbia alums outside of the tri-state area? So just take the last few minutes each just to kind of address um, the next six months and into next year and how people should be thinking about this and what the new normal is in your opinion. Good. Okay. It's a really, I mean, nobody has a crystal ball. Um, I wrote a blog a little while ago, Wall Street decided, except for one Wall Street firm, Wall Street decided not to lay off people in March. They decided they weren't going to lay people off the rest of the year. Guess what? Wall Street's starting to lay people off now. So, A, don't believe that there's not going to be more layoffs coming. But we're not here to talk about the negative. Um, some form of remote 
some form of remote uh, commuting is probably going to last in some industries. It may not last in others. Who knows? Um, I think the idea is to get the get the greatest network possible, because the more people you know in as many different areas as you know, the better off you're going to be. Um, you know, there's some truisms out there. Wall Street is shrinking. It's going electric, electronic. Wall Street doesn't need as many people. Pharma, healthcare needs more people. So there's some truisms that are going to be out there, arguably truisms out there, um, where certain industries are going to be growing, certain industries are going to be shrinking. Um, but when it comes to these nuances of should I buy a house 110 miles away from New York City, because if I'm home three days a week, I'm in the forest, but if I have to go into the office two days a week, it's hell, but it's only two days of hell. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think any of us really know. But I will say the trend I'm seeing in job search is that things are picking up a lot more. So as we go from March to May, my own business, an entire job market pretty much shut down. Um, so when June started happening, I started seeing my clients getting jobs. I started seeing more job postings for whatever that means. I'm skeptical. So I think the world is definitely starting to improve. Um, and there's no doubt that Facebook and Google and everybody else, they keep posting record earnings. So I guess the answer is try to find the right industry. The world is getting better from almost every indication I can see. So just push on the pedal as hard as you can, network and just learn new skills. Yeah, I'd agree. Of course, there's so many, so many free courses out there or moderately priced courses. Um, Columbia's are a little on the expensive side. I just investigated one Columbia marketing course. It was over a thousand bucks. Okay, I decided not to take it. But for you who need who want marketing, I think it's probably a good course. Can't, uh, uh, there's so many different courses out there. Coursera, Udemy. There's so many courses out there that can teach you new skills. So the the answer is diversify, meet people, just put yourself in the best position possible. Yeah. With a minute left for us, I, I'll add to that. And that yeah. is, this is the time you should be marketing your butt off right now. You should be meeting people. You should be engaging with people. You should be re-engaging with people that you haven't spoken to that could possibly help you. Uh, I'm re-engaging with my Latin American friends from 19 years ago because there's certain areas that I can do my work in Latin America. There's so many people out there that would love to hear from you. And all you have to do is rekindle the relationship and the new people that are out there that you can meet. So there is Zoom networking groups coming out the wazoo everywhere. You can be networking 24 hours a day if you're so crazy, but you have to pick the best of the ones that you're meeting new, and you have to pick the best of the ones of the people that you knew from before and use every opportunity to let them know you're out there and that you can help them as much as they can help you. And who knows when you need each other. It is such an open opportunity for you because everybody's a little lonely right now or mm -hmm. a little stuck. Sure. So sure. get out there and make it fun and have a laugh or two with people. See them on Zoom that you haven't seen in 15, 20 years. Yeah, we look different, but we're still the same people. Remind of the old days and how you can help them in the new. Well, thank you so much for that, Mark and Michael, for your time today. A lot of wonderful information. I'm gonna be sharing everything that you gave today, uh, the PowerPoint deck, all the links with everyone who registered for, for today. If anyone couldn't make it, they're still gonna get all that information. So if anyone is on this call who knows folks who couldn't get in and didn't have the time, uh, do not fret. We're gonna make sure you get all this information. Congratulations to the two winners uh, of, our, of our ticket pick today, our name pick. Um, I never did this formally, but uh, I'm, again, Jason DeLuca. I'm the president of the Club University Club of New Jersey. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry for not making that formal introduction. Um, our club is one of the largest alumni clubs in the United States with over about 20,000 uh, contacts in the state of New Jersey. Um, so we thank everyone for joining us today. Please follow us on Facebook and uh, in our newsletters because we do something like this at least once a week, every other week to try to bring the best of Columbia to you on a regular basis. So. Thank you. Thank Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we really appreciate your time today and your, your great wisdom and your um, great support of the alumni, Columbia alumni community. Thanks very much, Jason. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Cheers.